What makes a mother? Kids. <laughs> Love and concern. Love and concern. They don't father. I'm sorry, what? They don't father. They don't father? What makes a mother? They don't father? Yeah, you know, a father's a mother, a mother's a father. Okay, <laughs> all right. Child. Wow. Child. Children. We saw Mary Poppins on Friday night. Megan and Fiona and I went out on a uh, date night, the three of us. <laughs> it's not often. Mary Poppins. Many would say she's not a mother. But is she? Doesn't she mother everyone that she comes into contact with? How many of you have seen Mary Poppins Returns, the new one that's out, and, and the original one? That there's, there's a mothering aspect to Mary Poppins. So the question is out there as to what makes a mother. You were very quick to respond, children. I, for the longest time, bought into the idea that Matthew and Luke are the only Gospels that actually have a birth narrative, the story of birth. And as I've been studying the fourth Gospel, we're, we're going to be starting a Wednesday Bible study, and we'll be looking in depth at the Gospel of John, but we'll also be doing that here in worship for several weeks. I'm seeing things in an epiphany sort of way in the Gospel of John, something that I've never seen before. And I say that because I'm convinced now that John's gospel actually has a more definitive birth story than actually Matthew and Luke combined. These first 14 verses carry within themselves the most poignant and the richest birth language that we could ever imagine. John is most likely the last of the four gospels to be written, which means that John or the author of John had access to Matthew, Luke, and Mark before writing, and, and I think that the author intentionally chose to, to write a version that is vastly different than the other three. We'll delve into later in weeks ahead, but when we think about epiphany, that, that word that means divine revelation or new insight, a, a suddenly new approach or a new perspective on things, if it had an epiphany, a light bulb moment. Well, it's great to have this at the beginning of the year. You would think that maybe somebody somewhere designed our liturgy to have Epiphany coincide with a new year. It's apropos to consider that John and its unique take on who the Christ is in the beginning. Have you heard those three words somewhere else? Genesis, right? We just, uh, I just want to make sure. Yeah, Genesis. <laughs> When you hit those three words, John is basically trying to tell us, I'm setting you up right now in this book that you're about to read. I'm going to be making references to stories within the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, but to John, it was the only testament, because at that time, that was the only Testament available. There, there are going to be references galore that we go through in this gospel, starting at the beginning with, in the beginning. The moment, the very moment of creation where God gives birth to creation. Everything that has been born, John says, has been born through this word of God, that word is light. Remember these first few verses in the very first book within the scriptures. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. These, these words sound an awful lot like a womb. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Sounds a bit like a womb. 
God then said, let there be light, and sounds like delivery. And, and there was light, and God saw the light, and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and darkness he called night. And this is what John wants us to have in mind as he begins. The word was in the beginning, and his name was light, and this light is the beginning of all life. Life. Life proceeds out from the word. Is it just me, or does this sound like birth? And not so much the birth of Christ. See, John reads these other birth narratives and says, if you want a birth story, I'll give you a birth story. It's not so much about the birth of Christ as it is about Christ giving birth to all of us and all of creation. Yes, I believe that the author of John is trying to convey that Christ, Christ is the one who gives birth to all creation. Now, as I was talking with Megan about this and saying that Christ is the one who gives birth, there was this look on her face. <laughs> but this might seem radical. And the true definition of the word radical is to go back to the roots. But this isn't, this isn't far-fetched. This is, this is not reading into things. This is actually reading it for what it says. The Word was with God in the beginning, and everything came into being through the Word. How does that happen? How do we know how life happens within this world? Something must give birth in order for there to be life. And without the word, nothing, not one thing, John says, came into being. And the life was through the word, and the life was light. But those who did welcome him, John says, those who believed in his name, if you think I'm reading into things, listen to this. He gave them the power, the energy to become children. What was your definition before? What makes a mother? What did you say? Love and concern. Love and concern. Oh, what was your first answer? Children. Oh. Children. And he doubles down. He authorized them to become God's children, born not from blood, born not from human desire or passion, but born from God. The Word became flesh. Flesh. Sarks is the Greek word here. It's so interesting. Sarks for the word flesh only shows up in this kind of context in John. In all the other Gospels, the Greek word is somatos, body. In John, John uses the word flesh. It was uh, among the doctors of the time that they believed and used the term flesh for answering the question, where, where does the child originate from? Where, where does the child's flesh actually come from? And the prevailing medical notion at the time was that the sarks, the flesh, comes from the blood of the mother. Christ gives birth to creation, and then John doubles down and says the word, the Christ, then gives birth again, birth again, birth anew. This isn't going to be the only time that we find this in John. We'll come to chapter 3, and we'll hear that Jesus says you must be born anew again. This is very womb-like, birth-like, pregnancy and delivery-like language for the Word of God. And to see Christ in this way, to see the Word of God in essence as the one who gives birth and then new birth to all, this isn't a far-fetched concept for Paul later on says to the church in Rome, all of creation groans. In birth pangs. He says to the church in Galatia, for all who have been baptized in Christ, they are now children of God. Birth and 
waters. It radically flips on its head a ton of preconceived notions. And you say, wow, this is fantastic information, Phil. But how does it affect me in the next week? It's a good question. Like the Magi and like the shepherds that saw the star and chose the star to stay their minds on and be stayed, perhaps if we welcome the word of God in a new way today. I don't know about you, but the concept of thinking about the whole year is sometimes overwhelming. But if we consider starting each new day of welcoming the word of God, welcoming the light, welcoming, if we approach with just a molecule or a lepton of faith, no matter how, like magi and shepherds, like Mary, if we welcome it, ourselves into this story, into the possibility of a new birth, if we welcome Christ in this new way this week, then perhaps we may be born anew in Christ. Perhaps, perhaps this week you might want to reconsider or rethink or include a broader set of characteristics that might be helpful for you as they're helpful for me of who this Christ is fully is who comes in the flesh and dwells among us. Perhaps the characteristics of the strength and resolve of a mother or the gestational nature of Christ's love, looking at that beautiful growing edge that there can be personal and phenomenal new development within us, creative transformation that can occur in you and in me, that we can be changed and be born anew each day and that we might be able to give one another the mercy to be able to change. There's the characteristic of nurture, and care, and protection that is in Christ, and we don't offer enough airtime from the pulpits within our world that all of these characteristics we can unpack when we look at the author of John's Gospel and how the author gives birth to them. Let the light of Christ in you be born anew this week. Maybe just this. When you're weak this week, may you return and receive strength in Christ's arms. This Christ who said, to Jerusalem, oh, how I wish that I could gather you like a mother hen under my wings. When you're afraid, may you run to him and be nurtured and soothed. And when you're helpless, may you hold up your arms and ask for help. And when you may be crying, may you find that Christ is ready to wipe away every tear. And when you run into his caring and comforting arms, may you be reminded of love. These nurturing characteristics of Christ, may they envelop you this week to not fear, to not fear that nurturing nature, the protection and the fierce loyalty and the soothing soul care that Christ's loving birth in us, of us, that word of the womb may it give us soul care in these new opportunities that lay ahead each day.